All right, all right. So uh, let me re review for you what we did last time and also answer this question because he asked a very good question. Um, this is the review. So review, we talked about cohomological field theories. And cohomological field theories are basically set of, uh, set of basically uh, cohomology classes. So review, and this, uh, besides being review, also completes one of the, some of the in the question marks that we left unsolved last time. So that omega being omega, a set of, a system of omega gn, um, such that 2g minus 2 plus n is bigger than 0 is given, this, this, let this be a, be a cohomological field here. Okay, so this part, at least this basic definition for this, you can find in the last lecture. All right, so then uh, this is this was an, a, a system defined on the on a vector space together with a non-degenerate form on it. And uh, if this vector space has a distinguished identity element, we call that cohomological field theory with identity, otherwise just cohomological field theory. And what made these things called cohomological field theory was certain axioms that they needed to satisfy. A good example of cohomological field theory is the cohomological field theory associated with gramma witten theory. So these system of classes in the gramma witten case will be just gramma witten classes. So these are basically obtained by pulling back. There are vector spaces, just the cohomology theory of our variety. We pull back classes to the moduli space of the stable mass and we push them forward. And for every set of you know, V1 to Vr elements in here, we can associate to that some cohomology class, right? Which uh, kind of captures the, basically the curves with R mark points where for each marking you associate one of the elements of V. So that's, that gives you a system. And then the grammar within classes satisfy, you know, certain, certain conditions, right? So all of those conditions we have also from cohomological field theory. Difference between cohomological field theory and the and the grammar within classes is that these are more general. Here we have some some module over some algebra, commutative algebra, for which we define the composite field theory. Okay, so now let R be the be, a, be the R matrix. This was a matrix. R matrix series, which we define this way. So we call it R of Z, and it is given as k from 0 to infinity of R of k z to the k, which is an element of identity plus z times and the morphism of v, and some, some sort of power series in the variable z with coefficients and then the morphism. Okay? Which satisfies satisfies something we call symplectic condition. Symplectic condition, which for us was somehow r star of minus z times r of z equal to identity. This is what we call symplectic condition, and this is the adjoint of r with respect to the non-degenerate pairing that we define it. In the case of grammar within theory, this non-degenerate pairing, which was sending v times v to our underlying algebra, this thing in the case of grammar within theory, this guy was the cohomology theory of x, and this thing was just the intersection matrix, just the, the pairing of the, and this is some type of you know, extension of the Poincaré pairing. But here we have it for the matrix. Okay, so we have that. And then we, we said that we can define these operators, this kind of R matrix series, because it's really so many matrices, right, that are taking values in here plus identity. And well, we said that this R matrix acts on the on a given cohomological field theory. So we defined we defined a new cohomological field theory. New cohomological field theory by, by, by the action by the action of R 
on omega. And how did we do it? Uh, we just said that R omega, if I applied R on this system, which has now so many uh, pieces, R omega GNs, then the new system, R omega GN, is defined this way. It's a sum over stable graphs. So this is sum over stable graph, 1 over automorphism of gamma, the order of automorphism of the gamma. And this is uh, I gamma lower star of, I'll put the next uh, remaining part in here, of products of some, something over the vertices of the graph, contribution of vertices, times product over edges of my graph, contribution of edges, and times product over contribution of legs, over the leg, over, over the leg. And what was the business about these stable graphs? We just said that there is a graph theoretic description of the modulized state such genus G curves, stable curves, with R mark points, okay? And what that is, is that for every vertex, every vertex will be an uh, irreducible component of your curve. You can decorate each, each irreducible component by the, by the uh, genus. So for every vertex, you put some genus like that. You will connect the vertices if there is a, if the two components are connected to each other by node. So if you do that, you connect it like that. But then on each vertex, because it's an irreducible curve of given genus, you can have mark points. And for those, you will just add legs. So maybe two mark points in here and three mark points in here, as long as certain stability condition is satisfied on M bar G. Okay? So for this particular graph, you can basically see that um, you can basically see that for every vertex of this graph, this gives you a component, right? This is a component of configurations of curves of this genus with, n, with this many mark points, and there is a moduli for those things. And again, for this vertex also. So if I give you one of these graphs, for each vertex you have certain embedding of the moduli space that parameterizes this particular configuration for each vertex, you can embed that inside the moduli space of the bigger, bigger moduli space of genus G. So if this is genus 1, genus 2, all of this embeds inside the ambient moduli space of genus G curve. So basically what I'm trying to say is here, I of gamma is basically something from compactification of moduli space of the stable graphs into the moduli space of M bar GN, okay? And moduli space of the stable graphs is basically nothing but product over the vertices of M bar G of V and uh, N of V, meaning for, a, for each vertex, the genus of that vertex and the number of mark points on that vertex, basically number of legs. So you give me a graph for every vertex I have one of these components, I look at the product that gives me an embedding into the ambient moduli space. The genus and the number of mark points will add up to a given genus of X. So that's that. And Edges are these guys, and vertices are these guys. This is vertices, and the legs are these half edges like that, the legs. And what are, we define as contributions of edge, ver, uh, the vertex edge and the legs. Uh, so we define what those mean. Sorry, can I ask a question? Yeah. If we, what, do we, what do we should we do if we mark the node, node point, the intersection with two curves? Uh -huh. What's the graph of this case? Uh, There's two legs. Yes, yes, that's right. So you can have, you can have, that's right. So you can think of it as two half edges on the, on the two. Yeah. You, yes, that's a good question. So you would add those things on the vertex, because the node is also a mark, and if you mark it, then you will add one for this one, one for the other. As these are two irreducible, co connect, irreducible components connected to each other by a node, this marking is marking for both. So on an edge, you have this vertex, that vertex, you add a leg to each. Because that's what I saw you were doing it. Yeah, so. Okay, um, 
So what is the contribution of the vertex? This is basically omega of g of v and n of v. So for that vertex, I have something similar to grammar within class, but it's not grammar within class. It's a, one of those elements of my cohomology theory, and this is what it is, right? And um, yeah, okay. oh. one other thing, did I? Yeah, I don't have my notes on here, so that's fine. Yeah, okay, so I have one of these things. And then um, for contribution in that formula, contribution of the edge is basically we defined it to be, um, okay, so maybe I put the configuration of leg first because that's easier. So this thing is actually um, R acting on psi of L. R of psi of L. And what is psi? Where psi L is an element in H2 of m bar g of v n of v with rational coefficients. If you have a leg, which is, it is supposed to be attached to a vertex, and well, that's a marked point. You look at the cotangent, co cotangent bundle of the curve at that marked point, and you take its turn class, C1, and that's an element of H2 of your marginalized space, and this is the psi of L. Now, this guy is, a, is a, some sort of a power series in this variable z with coefficients and endomorphism of your vector space. You can evaluate it at that, instead of z, you can evaluate it at that cohomology class, right? And you can then define the notion of product, so basically the powers of z will be just tensor product of these cohomology classes. Okay, so that's what it is. So psi of L is the cotangent class, cotangent class at the marking, um, at the marking corresponding to, corresponding to leg N. Okay, and then we have the contribution of the edge. So this is more involved. We defined it this way. H uh, minus 1 minus R of psi prime of edge. H minus 1 R of psi double prime of edge. Transpose. Divided by psi prime of edge plus psi double prime of edge. So this is an edge in here. Like that. It is a node. Right? It is a node, and uh, you can evaluate the cotangent. I mean, this it's a node on the on this irreducible curve. It is a point of this irreducible curve, and also on that one is a point of that irreducible curve. So that node in particular gives you two tangent bundles. Like take the tangent of that one at the node, take the tangent of this one at the node, take the cohomology classes. Those will be psi prime and psi double prime, and then you can define this matrix. Okay. Okay, so these are cotangent classes at the edge, at the two vertices corresponding to the edge. Okay, so this is how you define the contributions, and this is this is what defines you the action of this R matrix on your cohomological field here. So note that this contribution of the edge is an element of v squared times homology class of uh, m bar g prime n prime times homology theory of m bar g double prime n double prime. Okay. It's a uh, it's like the class that you associate to some curve with two markings. Okay. Okay, so these are the labels of the vertices. These are labels of the vertices adjacent to that edge.
Okay. Now in coordinates, maybe I add a remark. In local coordinates, so we can write this in local coordinates. So what does it look like in local coordinates? I can choose a basis for V. So let uh, E mu be a Q basis. Of v. For instance, I can pick a particular Q basis of the cohomology theory of Monteverdi. If I was doing, uh, if I were doing, uh, from a, you know, gram of Witten theory, for instance. If I do do that, then I can choose this basis, the components of our matrix. The components of our matrix are. Um, R new moon of Z such that if I wanted to know what is R of Z, how is R of Z acting on the mu f basis vector in my in, in the V, that will be just summing over new R new mu of Z E new. That's how it is defined. And by the way, I'm thinking if we put that the camera on that chair, mm -hmm. like all the way back, maybe we could cover more of the black blackboard. Not blackboard, but blackboard. <laughs> Let's see. Yeah, this is much better. In fact, this is how we did it last time. of this basis, the Q basis of V, then I can say that this contribution of edge, which is a matrix with new new elements, new new components, is basically given by eta mu nu, that's the non-degenerate uh, matrix that we had, minus sum over rho sigmas of R new rho of psi prime of E, eta rho sigma, R new sigma, psi double prime of E. Okay. And divided by psi prime of E plus psi double prime of E. And well, this is an element of cohomology theory of m bar g prime n prime times a to star of m bar g double prime n double prime. I hope this is now much better. Isn't it much better? Yes, because we have now expanded it out and so on. I just needed to find the right reference point. Okay. Um, okay, so that's that. This fraction. Um, maybe I'll put it this way, um, simplify. The fraction um, eta mu nu minus some rho sigma r mu nu of z eta rho sigma r mu sigma of z divided by uh, w. W divided by Z plus W is a power series of 
in z and w. The reason is because if you actually put z equal to minus w, this thing vanishes. It divides. Okay? But the power series in z and w. So evaluating this thing as a side prime of i and side, side double prime of i, other, uh, 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 obviously gives you a power series in the two cohomology. So there is a whole piece of the that. Okay. All right. So we define this R matrix and its action on the cohomological field theory. And um, okay. Uh, and then uh, so just remember that. R, we just mentioned this symplectic relation. We, we had this relation and in coordinates, this is the same as saying rho sigma R mu of R mu rho z. So rho sigma R mu sigma minus z is eta mu. Okay, so and this is why, because this is a symplectic thing now. If I plug in z equal to minus w, this becomes equal to that. And this is the proof that this thing vanishes, so it's a power series in z and w. Okay, so it's because of the symplectic thing. Okay, um, now remark. Remark is this, um, uh, if omega is a homological field theory with a unit, with a unit, uh, our gamma, our omega, might not respect the unit, might not uh, Um, so who worked on this thing? The first person who worked on this R matrix formalism. So was uh, so R matrix was first defined for gamma within field, which is deeply you know it's almost the same as gamma within classes and so on. The you know, the operator that acts on gamma within classes. So R matrix formalism applied to from a within theory was in fact defined by defined by given R. He's the first person to do this. Okay? And then this action of our matrix on the on the cohomological field theory associated to gamma within theory was lifted to all other cohomological field theories by others. So then the action of R on other homological field theories was lifted. Oh, sorry, the action of R was lifted to one on other homological field theories um, by work of Telemann and Shadow. History behind it, and then given Tall and Telemann gave a, basically a classification of cohomological field theories using this R matrix formalism, which is extremely important. Um, so, which we also discussed last time. So, what is that? Um, to discuss the given tall Telemann formalism, the classification, I need to um, tell you about the second action. 
second action on this phenomenological field theory by translation. And this is the thing that I couldn't answer last time when there was some confusion about what this operator really, how is it defined formally on the phenomenological field theory. So now let T in a power series, this time not be in the morphism algebra of V, but just the V itself, be a series with no degree zero or one terms. Either zero or, uh, or one terms. no terms of degree 0 and 1, then uh, T of Z is defined by T2, Z squared, plus T3, Z cubed, all the way, where TKs are elements of Z. Okay? Just elements. Uh, so definition, now, let uh, T gamma be the new with the homological field theory obtained by obtained by um, so how do I define it? I define it this way. So T gamma, T omega is GN component of well acting on V1 to Vn is defined by summing from n equals to zero infinity, one over n factorial p n lower star of omega g n plus m of v one to v m then t psi n plus one all the t psi n plus m. That's how we want to define it. Here p m it's the forgetful map that sends us from m bar g n plus m to m bar g n, and it forgets the m bar things. And this is where he was confused about what this is. Okay, so let me define that. This is a formal kind of formal way of writing things. So this is kind of, um, so I write it this way. This is a sum inside sum, really. So I want to, this is sum over all m, and I would like to take this class and uh, basically expand this one. So where is this defined? This is defined in v to the m tends to the homology theory of m bar g n plus m because you have m, m elements of v introducing this class where for m bar points on your curve you're associated with class and that gives you a class and then continue with the class and the class. Okay. So let me just tell you what this means when I apply this operator on my homology class. Those are again side classes, those are potential classes at those extra mark points. So here, omega g n plus m of t of psi n plus 1, t of psi n plus m. This thing is defined by summing over k equal to 2 infinity um, psi n plus 1 to the k psi n plus m to the k and then omega g n plus m t uh, n plus m n1 n plus m. 
this is how we define it. So with this notation, we can put this one here. So what we really need to, the way that this is interpreted is that, remember that these t's, tk's are elements of the v. So these are, in, in grammar within case, these are cohomology classes of your variety. So you have n of them taken here, okay? And so, and then together you have, uh, you have, this should be n. n. So you have n of these and then m of these, but these are also made of elements in V. And then the way we interpret this is that we add these cotangent classes for the m elements. So we decorate further our grammar within class by these cotangent classes. Okay? So that's how we explain it. This, is, this was the formal thing, which wasn't in the paper that we did with this. Okay. Now, given to Kalamon classification, what was that about? Uh, let omega be a semi-simple Homological field theory uh, with unit with unit on on some vector space. So on the data. This is the unit of U. And let omega be uh, the topological part of omega. Be the topological part of omega. Again, if you learned in the previous session, so we associate cohomology classes and M bar G N. So often our system is defined as elements inside here, M bar G N times V or over A, so over Q, um, over times V times um, A, something like that. If I just use degree zero classes, this is what we call topological field theory. And we show it by omega. Okay? So every cohomological field theory has a topological piece, which is the smaller piece. And so let's say omega is a topological part of the cohomological field theory. And, and so then, what is the statement is the following. Mm, for a for a um, symplectic R matrix, we find the following action of R on T, so or R on, on omega. Define R acting on omega by really acting R. This is the definition. R acting on T acting on omega. T can act, right? It's an act, it acts on the cohomological field theory. In particular, it acts on the topological part. And T of Z in here is really Z times identity minus R of Z. Um, acting on one of V. And this defines for me something in here. Okay, this is how it is. And then I can act, I can just evaluate this as omega. All right, so we can talk about this right here. So this defines T of the omega. 
And R of C of omega, I would like to just call it R dot omega, the action of R and omega. Then here is the theorem. Theorem due to Giventhal and Telemann about the classification is that there exists a unique R matrix uh, which reconstructs a semi simple homological field theory omega from its topological part omega the following way. The way I defined it here. <coughs> As a homological field theory with units. If you have some semi stable homological field theory, then you can always find the unique, unique R matrix with respect to which you can define an action of R on the topological part for which you need the second translation action, T. And how does it act? It acts like this. You evaluate it at omega. And then this statement is saying that if you have a semi-stable homological field theory, it's always defined by action of a unique matrix you can find. If you can find it, then that's what you want. The topological part is the one that is a stand by zero yeah, class. How do I see like, like, you know, the, what, what I usually heard of people saying topological field theory is a function of convergence theory, like convergence field theory, like field theories. How does that come up? Like the mm. metric spaces. Yeah. Um, are those the same thing? Um, so. No, um, that's topological. Uh, no, I don't know. I cannot find that. It's not TTA. What? Topological quantum. Yeah. Which, um, so, let me see. The reason why I'm asking is Wow. Say it again, your definition? It's a well, it's a from, 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 from the covertism. Or the this is kind of similar to that. You can okay. say that. Because if you have a, depends on what kind of a TQFT you're looking at, right? Uh -huh. So for instance, if you have 2 plus 1 TQFT, uh -huh. then that means you have, you're looking at the vortices between one dimensional things and they swap, sweep through you these uh, Riemann surfaces, That's Riemann true. V, That's right. right? And the Riemann surface you can decorate with the genus and the number of one points. That's right. So then the topological field theory in that context gives you a, associates to the, to the given Riemann surface a, a, a certain vector in the Hilbert space, which for us is going to be the cohomology class that we define. OK. So because the reason why I'm asking, I know this is sort of obvious, this is kind of completely understanding of the field. This gives me a vibe of the sort of the theory of convergence and field theory. Like I'm, I'm curious if there's anything that they relate. I will know. Okay. Yeah. 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 Might. Yeah. It, it seems like it. Right. It seems mm -hmm. like. It seems like it has the same vibe. Yeah. At least superficially seems to look yeah. similar. Yeah. But I don't know because I didn't okay. focus on that part. Yes. Maybe. Mm -hmm. But that's a good question. Maybe I can read about it. Okay, um, so this is what it is, the given tall Telemann classification, which we will use actually. And it is extremely important to use for cohomological, to, to use this kind of classification for cohomological field theory. This is, the, this is basically telling you that a given cohomological field theory is recovered by, by computing the R matrix of that T. This is highly important because now you want to prove that for Hilbert small points on some variety, 
we are doing cohomological field theory associated with the grammar with the theory of that morality, and you would like to match certain things, the threefold theory with the Hilbert scheme theory and so on, then the answer basically would be that calculate the R matrices and basically show the compatibility between the corresponding R matrices, right? So on the Brahma Witten side, you can calculate the R matrix, but this is this is the beauty and basically shows you the application of cohomological field theory. On the Hilbert scheme side, you can just define honestly without with, without any regards to Brahma Witten theory, you can just do, do you know uh, cohomological field theory. Like quantum cohomology, right? Quantum cohomology. Basically, without having any notion of Brahma Witten side, but you could define quantum cohomology. So, this is, this is why. So, we are going to match our matrices rather to prove the correspondence as we are looking at. An example uh, of, of this correspondence and this classification is the following. If you let your V to be just Q, <laughs> And uh, then your intersection pairing defines the one just gives you one in V. And one in V just call it one, number one. If this is the one, then omega GN one one one, right? This will be just turn class of the Hodge bundle. And uh, this is the rank G Hodge bundle. This is the Hodge bundle. And uh, the topological part in here is just trivial. The topological <coughs> part uh, is trivial. Cohomological field theory in this case. And the R matrix can be calculated. The R matrix can be calculated for this particular example to be the thing that calculates the churn character of the rank G Hodge bundle on the Monte Cristo series. So this is an outcome of calculation. So basically, there is some calculation you can do R of Z, in this case turns out to be exponential of K for one to infinity of EQK. These are Einstein series and so forth. QK, QK minus one, Z to the QK minus one. And this actually result uh, was uh, is due to the result of Momford who actually calculated the churn character of a rank G Hodge bundle on the Monte Cristo series on L bar G N. Okay, but you can investigate whether this is correct and this is correct. Okay, so this is an example, and we have this calculation was basically by Brooke. So um, now this is this is all that uh, we wanted to basically we kind of last time we discussed, okay? And now uh, we also discussed about this Hilbert scheme formalism. So what if your uh, your target is the Hilbert, right? So well, how far do I want to go? So this is a repetition, so um, the, the cohomological field theory for Hilbert of C2, um, uh, well, this is defined by, is determined by T equivariant. So your, your, your vector space in here will be the T equivariant cohomology theory of C2. And this is defined by T equivariant um, Brahma Witten theory. Of Hilbert C2. So if I want to just uh, construct 
the vectors, the vector space V, for instance, I will just look at an algebra, and this would be the Q algebra in equivariant parameter P1, P2, and I will look at the power series with these coefficients in some form of variable Q, and then I will construct my focus space, and I have the focus space, and I extend it over Q over this, with this A, and remember that focus space for the focus space was given by the direct sum n zero to infinity of all Hilberstein um, cohomology series of Hilberstein of n points on the variety. Here we're looking at the nth piece. So in this f of n, every cohomology class, every every element of this this focus space is given by a certain partition of n, and to partition that n, you label the partitions by cohomology theories, all right? And homology theories of our variety. Here we just use this formal algebra Q T1, Q2. So our V becomes formal like that. Before it was in that. Right? So this was equivariant homology theory of your variety. So we have that, and um, so then here the inner product on this V, so we have a notion of inner product of structure on V, like this, which is defined by inner product of some partition mu, partition mu was redefined before, like that, and this was minus one to the length cardinality of mu minus length of the partition mu divided by T1, T2 to the length of the partition mu. I'm just reviewing, so that's why I'm going very fast. Delta mu nu, and some something in the denominator that keeps track of the automorphism of that particular partition. So that was a non-degenerate pairing on our vector space. Um, and so both of the co I mean, basically in here, the cohomological field theory that you associate to this V, I mean this V, by the way, has an identity element, right? There is an identity element in the focus space. And the cohomological field theory that you associate to this V is semi-simple. So now, given t given to all um, Telemann classification tells you that there is a unique R matrix that generates this semi-simple cohomological field theory from its topological type. It constructs it from its topological type. What are these? To, to just the degree zero classes. Take the degree zero, degree zero classes in the hilbert What is that? The vacuum. Yeah. Okay. So, so then we did that, and now we would like to see, um, we would like to see how should we define the R matrix. What is this R matrix that we want to work with? So maybe then I talk about the R matrix for uh, our matrix formalism. Or hill band of C2. Fantastic. Okay, so let us first define some things. So consider the genus zero from a Witten potential. This for the hill band we defined before. This is some sum of gamma is defined as some sum d equals zero infinity q to the d r from zero to infinity of one over factorial gamma r many times, the r point of gamma within part function, which you define on the Hilbert scheme. You're counting curves into the Hilbert scheme with uh, genus zero and degree d. And gamma is in d and in d in this scheme. Now we are defining a cohomological field theory for our Hilbert scheme. We 
have constructed our V. We have constructed the notion of system of similar to the grammar within classes, a system of grammar within classes, but these are just some classes in the cohomology. And we would like to relate this cohomological field theory that this gives us to the partition function of genus series functions. Okay? If you want to understand how, what are, what, what's going on, think about this. What's the relation between drama within classes and drama within invariants? Drama within invariants are given as integrals of drama within classes. Right? So if I want to rewrite this in the, in the, in the sense of R matrix, the R matrix acts on your cohomological field theory. It's a matrix. And this basically, this integration tells you that the coefficients of the R matrix should give you the drama within Right? So somehow your your partition function should be related to the R matrix by looking at the coefficients of R. Right? It's a matrix with coefficients acting on these cohomology classes and it introduces for you newer system of cohomological field theory. Okay, so okay. So this is a formal series. Formal series in the ring A dual of V. Uh, the fact that you have a non-degenerate pairing on V basically gives you an isomorphism between V and V dual. So this is that. Where A in here is again. You have this partition function. What am I trying to say in this? Um, so the T covariant um, the T covariant, these are the equivariant characters of the action of C star square of C two. The T covariant uh, genus zero. Potential, okay, which I call F zero, of an C two, okay, uh, defines a a formal Frobenius or a formal Frobenius manifold. V, the quantum product on it and the non degenerate pairing. Right? The small quantum cohomology obviously gives you a Frobenius structure to the cohomology theory of your variety. Here, it's not the cohomology theory of our variety necessarily, it's just the vector space V. So, well, but it is similar. And this defines a notion of a Frobenius structure on the algebra of that variety. And this is an algebra over this ring. This one. It's an A algebra. So this gives you a Frobenius manifold structure for this. At the origin, um, remark it can be proved. This is due to Alcunkov and Van den Fande and the things that we did before on the cohomology theory of Hilden of C2. It can be proved that A is a rational function on Q. So it's a rational function on Q. A is rational in Q. It's a variable Q. 
So in fact, if we look at the field of rational functions and the variable q, we can, we can basically say that this defines a Frobenius manifold structure on not a, but the rational functions and variables t1, t2, and t3. So if q, which is q, T1, T2, Q is the, is the field of rational functions on mm, in Q, then the statement is that F0 Hill band C2 is an element of gamma, is an element of this Q, this Q, this is rational numbers, this is our Q, <coughs> but the power series, the co coefficients in this Q. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so but the point is that this guy and the quantum cohomology that we define in here defines for you a structure of a Frobenius formal Frobenius manifold on it. So what are we trying to say? So I actually decided when I was writing my notes, I decided to give you a kind of little uh, preparation, or kind of a remind you of the background of Frobenius manifold. We have done this before when we were doing higher genus uh, grammar witten theory and so on. We looked at the super manifold. And Structure on it. So maybe this is a big remark. Remark a Frobenius manifold consists of four uh, mathematical structures. Mathematical structures. So what are those things? You have M and G and A and the vector one within that. What is M? M is a complex uh, manifold of dimension M. Okay, so that's one they are. G um, is a holomorphic. Symmetric, non degenerate uh, quadratic form on it. Metric. It's a metric. Right? Holomorphic metric. Three, A is a the morphic symmetric um, tensor, which actually has this structure. So A is a tensor that takes you from Tm times Tm times Tm to holomorphic functions of M. And this is tangent bundle of M. These are tangent bundles of M. You, have, you need to have that. And four, uh, one is a holomorphic uh, vector field on T. So first, G is with whatever one is. Yes. Oh, that's right. So, but subject to certain conditions, we are not done with this. Oh, we need to have certain conditions. On TM, yeah. G is on TM. Yeah. 
So, so subject to the following conditions, um, subject to the conditions that, okay, now I need to tell you about what makes this Frobenius after all. It's the interaction between the G and A, right? This is the one for us that was playing the role of quantum product. Um, so A and G, A and G together um, define a uh, mechanistic product on uh, on PM by G of X, Y, and Z to be equal to A, X, Y, Z. And uh, these are holomorphic vectors in general. Okay, so we have that. Okay, so furthermore, so this is part A, we also need to have the following conditions. We need to have a condition of flatness that G is a flat holomorphic metric. And that M is covered by open sets U equipped with um, uh, yeah, let's write it this way equipped with a the commuting um, basis of G flat holomorphic vector groups. Okay. So these groups would be X one to X, let's say XM. It's n dimensional in sections of the tangent bundle such that you have some potential on this manifold. So, such that there exists a holomorphic potential function. Like that with A of Xi Fj Xj to be equal to Xi Fj Xk acting on P. Right. Then you need to have G, you need to have that this one, this product, this structure is associated. And finally, you need to have that one is a flat unit vector field. Okay, so. All of these you can see we already have on the Frobenius formal Frobenius manifold to define in by, by quantum cohomology. So T is the potential. So T is our potential. And the vector fields that we get are given by the derivatives. If you remember that 
we did big quantum cohomology, we defined these vector fields by taking derivatives of this um, full potential. Yeah. Very cool, no? Okay, so then back then we needed to first really do this. Okay, so this is this is the what is a Frobenius manifold. And the point is that um, the cohomological field theory that you associate to the Hilbert scheme of n points defines a Frobenius manifold structure, a formal Frobenius manifold structure on the vector space structure with respect to the operation given by quantum product. So now, if you think of it as a form of manifold, you can basically describe it in certain local coordinates. And those local coordinates enable you to define these vector fields, and so on, right? So, uh, the ray exists, now for us, maybe I mentioned here, here, for us, maybe I mentioned it this way, for us, after, Extending Q um, after extending Q to its closure, um, the formal Frobenius manifold that it induces. Structures. Formal for Venus times the two inner areas defines a semi simple uh, algebra tangent to V its or and at its origin. Which is a small quantum cohomology of the bed. I'm just repeating the thing we know already. We have seen. Right. So the Frobenius structure, everything is actually. Realize by looking at the tangent bundle on the manifold. That's why you need to go to the tangent bundle and that's what you do. This becomes a semi simple algebra. Okay. All right. So let's see. What are the local coordinates with respect to which I can define? Uh, basically, I can study my manifold, my Frobenius manifold. Um, let f mu or e tilde of mu be the idempotence potence of the quantum product. On V, right? We can have idempotence, and we can use the idempotence at the basis of our our Frobenius manifold. These satisfy eta of epsilon tilde mu nu is equal to delta mu nu. Um, So we can also choose, we, we use, we can use epsilon mu as a basis um, as a basis of um, basis of basically this P. Uh, 
Um, so then we can also define, we can also have a different basis. Del mu for any mu and v. And that's also we can have two bases we can define, and the, the two of them are transformable to, to each other. So there is we can define psi to be a change of basis matrix, which actually is defined by its new component is basically given by eta epsilon nu maybe p mu and this is going to be an element of the closure of this field of rational functions in there with t the power series and t star. This we saw already in higher genus one of our written differential theorem, right? This kind of structure. We defined flat coordinates, if you remember there, with the TIs, we had cohomology classes. For each cohomology class of degree i, we chose little TI that we coupled the two with. And then those were the flat coordinates in our Frobenius manifold, or the super manifold. And the TI times TI had an even degree. And they had, alone they had odd or even degrees, so it was a superstructure on our manifold. With respect to the TIs, we, took, we defined the notion of the derivative of the, our potential function, and that derivative was giving us all the structures that we wanted. So for instance, WDDD equation was actually giving us the structure, associativity of the big quantum class. Remember all of that? Yeah. We can do the same thing in here, except now we are doing it formally for B. So there exists a unique, in fact, unique canonical coordinate coordinate system at, um, at the origin. Which is basically like this. Mu mu again is an element in here. Mu are partitions of n. Right. And which can be defined, which can be defined to satisfy satisfy mu mu of zero equal to um, zero and d d mu mu equal to epsilon mu, the item function. If you don't understand what this is. Just think about those little ti, the flat coordinates we defined, and see the properties that they will satisfy. So we have a certain flat coordinate system for this Frobenius manifold. We put it like this way. Then we have the quantum differential equation. quantum differential equation, um, which is the following. So it is um, something like this equals zero. And just like before here where here S tilde is equal to um, R of Z e to the U over z, r of z, we know what it is. I just need to tell you what u is. And u is a diagonal matrix. With entries, uh, 
with uh, diagonal entries given by canonical coordinates. Canonical coordinates u mu. So this is um, an exponential, this is a power series and matrices, R of z times that. And that is your power series in z. And here, the quantum differential equation, again, is this one. And this guy, again, is the Dubrovin connection. So holomorphic Dubrovin connection that we defined before. So all of this is structure we can have, but you know, you need to be careful and you need to pay attention to the details. For instance, the local coordinates in here are, you know, the local coordinates in the brahma wooden case are the normal variety. They were being um, constructed, they were, they were flat coordinates associated to cohomology classes. Here there are also flat coordinates associated to cohomology classes, but cohomology classes in the Nakajima basis and the hypothesis. And those are being uh, given by basically partitioning your N with cohomology, with elements of this V. So this is what we mean here. We partition V by elements of V, coordinate zero. So we can define cohomology classes, and then for cohomology classes, we can define the flat coordinates on this Frobenius manifold, and then we can have quantum differential equations. That's double the GDB equation. Okay? All right. So, so, So yeah, basically, our R, an R matrix, we can define the R matrix for the theory of Hilbert system of n points to be a matrix which satisfies the symplectic conditions, which, is, which has a construction as identity times z times endomorphism, the power series in variable z with coefficients and endomorphism algebra of v, together with the satisfaction of this differential equation. So when you write S as R of Z times E, that is what distinguishes R hill from any other R matrix. It needs to satisfy this quantum differential equation. Okay. All right, question? My hand burns when I write on this blackboard. <laughs> I have had literally complete pain on my It's kind of a lot of detail, but because we have seen it this slowly, right, and, we, and, and before, it, it follows, right, it follows. It's very similar to what we have before. So, we have 15 minutes. Let me see. So, I have two questions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, start, start with the question. Do you know what it is? It's similar to before. It, there is a notion of Dobrovin connection that you can define for a Frobenius manifold. Yes. Yes. Um, so, actually, good question. Do you want me to basically define that? that that's a good question. So, I wanted to go through um, basically the two main theorems. Uh -huh. One is we would like to basically say how we use our matrix to define the full potential of this cohomological field theory associated to this Hilbert system of endpoints. Mm -hmm. The point is that there's a beautiful theory, theorem that these guys are proving and they are saying that by recovering the properties of this R matrix, we can see that all higher genus invariants, okay, are given by, in some way, deforming the genus zero invariants. So, they compute the R matrix or the genus zero part, this is the one that gives the zero uh, potential of your theory, and then the rest of the invariance, higher genus invariance, can be recovered from genus zero invariance, basically. That's, that's the main theorem that they are trying to prove. The second theorem that they are trying to prove is that now that we know on the Brahma-Witten side 
what is this uh, our matrix, we need to match it with the, with the or on the quantum cohomology side, we need to match it with the gamma Lucas side, basically. Mm -hmm. So we, we need to prove two theorems and we can do it next time. Gamma Lucas side, okay. So, meaning in terms of cohomology theory of Euclidean space. Yeah, that's right. Then how do you define the R matrix up there? You're proposing not. not yeah, we need, we need to, we need to. Yeah. Uh, another question. So this is saying that, well, the statement of the Julius Hartog. So let me, let me just yeah. mention something. Yeah. So we do two things, right? right? We have the R matrix which determines the gramma witness theory of Hilbert system of n points on C. Yeah. This is like doing quantum cohomology on Hilbert system of n points on C. That's right. Then we have the R matrix which determines the gramma witness theory of a certain universal curve on a modulized piece of genus G curves with n more points. So basically, we have the threefold gramma Lucan theory, and we have the gramma. Okay, so we have the we have this guy. Yeah. And we have an R matrix in here, whose coefficients give you gramma Lucan invariance mm -hmm. of the band. That's right. This is our vertex of this triangle. Then we have the gramma Lucan theory of this guy. And what is this? Uh -huh. This is the thing that fiber-wise over every point of this modulus this gives you one of those curves. So this is the family of three-fold theories. Okay. And then we have dt uh -huh. of So these are the threefold theories, and the statement is that these guys match. So there is an R matrix which you can associate to this cohomological field theory. Uh -huh. There is an R matrix which you have already, we, we are going to associate to this cohomological field theory. Coefficients of this R matrix give you this gramma with an invariance. Coefficients of this R matrix give you gramma with an invariance of, let's look at the fiber of this over here. So for instance, for a point in here, I get a curve times CT, this is a threefold. Coefficients of the R matrix in here give you gramma with an invariance of this threefold. You see how it is? That's what we are going to do. So you say that's in this thing, gramma with an invariance of this threefold. This is a family of threefold. It's given by the R matrix in here. We will define some R matrix in here. So we will define some R matrix, some R0 matrix in here. And we try to match that with the R matrix that we have in here. So am I really understanding what you're saying is that this like uh, quantum cohomology to the gramm witten theory comparison really is two steps. Mm -hmm. So first step is to actually relate the, to say that the quantum cohomology mm -hmm. determines the full gramm witten yeah, right. theory. Right. And then so first we need to understand how to compute it in. Uh -huh. Higher genus gramma with an invariance in here because that's the big quantum cohomology of Hilbert system of n points on C. Right. And okay, we look at the the cohomological field theory, which now has the higher genus data in it. Right. In in some way, we are looking at the moduli space of genus G curves with n mark points with target given by this variety. Uh -huh. Okay. So we look at that R matrix and then we realize that. That R matrix is recoverable from the R matrix of the genus zero cohomological field right. theory. Basically, we, we prove the following thing by, by analyzing the R matrices. We are proving that the higher genus gramma with an invariance in here are all constructed from genus zero invariance. Right. So, so, and the second step would be to try to match the cohomological theory. To match this with this. To ma match those two gramma with exactly. the Exactly. The two gramma with this. And is that matching like a more general phenomenon? Like uh, so, so, so here you're comparing two different gromov theories. That's right, that's right. And the, the, is, do we know if like, that holds more generality than, than like, well you, well, you said before, right, like, well, quantum cohomology to... Uh, no, no, so, no. So often the thing that holds in more generality is this part. Right, so you said this part is the this most is the, general This is part. the most general part. So this... Like, often this these holds. two guys break. 
Right, and I'm asking, does break at which part? Breaks at the part where like this, like try to apply this. Yeah, matching, and matching the R. Oh, matching the part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what it is. Yeah. So what uh, what what we are doing this week? This is uh, today we did, and the next session we do is actually we are just we have, we know we now know one thing, which is when we do a small quantum cohomology, we have a triangle like this only when our variety is either C two or some resolution of the singularity, a n-type singularity on C2. Same in here, we are still doing C2, but now we are doing the higher genus version of that. And this is a hard problem again. So we just realized that when we do big quantum cohomology, we just take the big quantum product, we have this Frobenius manifold, and we are trying to go back to the earlier sessions that we had a potential and we had a WDDD type equations, and the big quantum product was captured by satisfaction of WDD. The associativity of the big quantum product is satisfaction. Mm -hmm. So this WDDD type differential equation is the quantum differential equation there, and it uh, basically induces certain conditions on the R matrix. Mm -hmm. And then you, that, that actually, this condition on the R matrix determines the R matrix of this theory. As we will see next time, that differential equation determines what the R matrix of this theory would look like. Mm -hmm. And not only that, the differential equation actually tells you that the higher genus invariant can be recovered from the lower genus invariant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it's truly remarkable. So, so that so last part comparable to the one with Part. That's mm -hmm. that's just a, that's just like a direct like, yeah. computation. And, yeah, direct. Uh, that's and, a computation. But but it breaks. But it yes. also breaks. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. I see. Yes, that's right. It's it's a very computational. Approach. Often this part is really much easier to do. Uh huh. Um. The theorem I would like to prove is the following. Two main theorems. Maybe I just mentioned the theorem. So the theorem is the following. One, and we end it today, but then we come back to it next time. So theorem one, which is about the structure in here, is the following. So this is about the following. So R matrix of the T equivariant drama Witten theory of Hill band of C2 is uniquely determined by um, Determined from the T T uh, from uniquely determined from the T equivariant equivariant genus zero. This is the important thing. It's a remarkable theory and divisor equation. Divisor equation and the degree zero invariant. The divisor equation was the one that in Grama Witten classes we, we, we have. If you pulled back divisor classes, your integral, I mean, remember the higher genus Grama Witten invariance. Whenever we have the expansion in the divisor classes, that was appearing as some exponential term. And we could simplify, we had the divisor equation which we could simplify our n pointed Grama Witten number to something like an n minus r pointed Grama Witten. So we have a divisor equation in here, and uh, it determines the R matrix for higher genus gramma Witten invariant. And basically, we are going to show that if I have some vector of cohomology classes like mu, labeled by partitions of n, the only invariants that we get, non-vanishing invariants, are going to be the following ones. So genus one with the 
the uh, zero mark point in partitions of n um, being restricted to eta, I will tell you what that means. M11, Euler class of the dual of the high bundle tangent at point eta of hill band of C2. And this is some t fixed points on the hill band. Basically, the final bar divided by all the class of tangent at that t fixed point of hill band of C2. And we know what this means. If you give me a partition, uh, Okay, so you can give me a partition of n, but then in the Hilbert scheme, we know that the C2 is being acted on by C star square, and then we can define the T-phase points of the Hilbert scheme. Those are associated with young tableau diagrams. The box can have boxes around, clustered around the origin, and each one of those finite configurations gives us a jack polynomial. And the jack polynomial is the image of that configuration in the Falcon space, in the equivariant Falcon space. And this, is, this is what that means. We take the tangent of this guy at that t fixed point, mm -hmm. given by the jack polynomial in here. And okay, and then for the higher genus guys, genus bigger than equal to zero, this is determined again by summing over all partitions of n. Integrating only over modulizing the genus G curves. This time genus G Hodge bundle, this is genus one Hodge bundle, times tangent space at the T fixed point of the Hilbert system. Uh, order class uh, space at that. And all the other invariants vanish. These are the only higher genus non trivial invariants. But these basically gen generate the rest of the invariants. Okay. And uh, yeah. So, yeah, so this can be calculated by the Jack polynomial associated to this, which we did last time. And this means the restriction of this to the t fixed point. This cohomology class. So why so no? Why so four? Why you can integrate that? Hmm? Why you can integrate the, the formula right here? The Euler characteristic? Uh -huh. This is the Euler class. Oh, the class. Oh, okay, okay. It's the, yeah, yeah. It's the normalization. It's the, yeah, yeah, the okay, localization. So it's the localization calculation. So, Anyway, so this is the theorem that you are going to, this is the first theorem. This gives you full structure of basically this guy. All the higher genus gram of the invariants of Hilbert of C2 are given by matrix coefficients of the R matrix that you can define in here. And that R matrix, um, the matrix coefficients of that R matrix will give you these invariants. And these are the only non trivial higher genus invariants. So the way we, we prove this is by literally looking at the R matrix, the property of the R matrix, and the quantum differential equation that this R matrix satisfies on the Frobenius manifold that it induces on your gate is, is the one responsible for this kind of structure. So we obtain this, the first thing that we prove next time is this one. And then I prove maybe this part. And then we leave that. Yeah, okay. So you would open up and let you go first to the comparison of that. Mm -hmm. Did they use this intensity or did they do like in fact is this what they did? Okay. Yeah, that's right. If for the Hibbert score of n points on C2, which is just a small quantum mm -hmm. they actually computed this by the quantum operator N D that you define. Right, right. And then they computed this and then they computed. Yeah, but the in fact is that they computed those and match. Did they also go through the 
So no, for higher genus, you don't need this formalism. You don't need this flat coordinates, and you don't need any of those things, right? But for big quantum cohomology, the quantum product and the big quantum, the associativity and all of the properties are given by the, basically the satisfaction of the WDVD equation, right? Mm -hmm. It is the Dobrovin connection that gives you all the structures that you want for big quantum cohomology. For small quantum cohomology, you don't need to go through, through that, right? Yeah, that's all well, my, 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 I guess that's my question. It's sort of, so when they first... Yeah. When they first looked at the small quantum yeah, quantum, yeah, small quantum. They, did, they, they computed this thing. And then they computed the bottom thing. They three. computed the bottom and thing and they matched nice. them. And then the, the argument for this one was easy. Okay, uh, yeah. so, 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 uh, let's see. Yeah, often the thing that breaks is here. Okay, great. So maybe 